Well, hello, hello, Beliefflings. Today's special episode release is a rare glimpse at our expansion episodes offered at beliefhold.com. Today we present expansion episode, Dark Watchers of the California Coast. When looking at regional anomalous phenomena, one of the most enduring and mysterious examples are the dark, skulking figures that regularly appear on the cliffs of California's central coast. Join us as we endeavor to uncover the truth behind these enigmatic figures by pairing historical research with bizarre reports of inexplicable encounters. And if you enjoy this episode, sign up for the members only expansion to get full length bonus episodes. Yes! Just like this, every time we release a show on the public feed. And one final thing the epic premiere of season five starts on Friday, January 27th at 9 p.m. Eastern and 6 p.m. Pacific. Watch it on YouTube, where you can interact with us as well as everyone else in the chat. Now get ready as we peer through the mists in search of the dark. Watchers. Along the California coast sits the stunning and mysterious Santa Lucia mountain range. With the mountain peaks jutting from the sea, this majestic tract of unbroken coastal terrain cradles a variety of wildlife and landscape. From crashing coves and cliff sides to green rolling hills and redwood forests. But among this wild beauty, there have been reports of phantoms. Dark looming watchers have allegedly been seen since the arrival of the Spanish in the 1700s, and perhaps going back millennia earlier with the native Chumash people. Reported by travelers and locals alike, the accounts remain consistent. Adorned in dark cloaks and wide brim hats, these black giants of the fog stand motionless and with featureless faces, surveying the crags and cliffs with a haunting, uninterrupted gaze. Should you approach one of these ever-vigilant sentinels, they will simply vanish into the mist that surrounds the secrets of this ancient land. Creepy, wide brim hats. Yeah. Unusual. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. Right? And I like I like this the mood that's being set. The mood works well, I think. Reminds me of um pilgrims. Pilgrims. When I think of wide brim hats. It is a weird uh, characteristic. California's pretty. This area specifically is gorgeous. It's nothing compared to Canal Fold in the Northeast Ohio in the winter. <laughs> we live in a beautiful part of the world. It is beautiful at times. Yes, it is actually Spring beautiful. Spring and summer, it's un- untouchable. Nothing like that, though. We don't have the mountains or anything. Yeah. You know? like, we, don't, we don't have grand. We have like Hobbit style Yeah, it's beauties. like uh, the Shire. You have little shires and valleys here and there yeah. and hollers. But yeah, this area is gorgeous. Specifically the Santa Lucia. And that's pronounced... It's got to be Lucia. That's what I thought, but according to like the Santa Lucia Highlands, I guess, is like big wine country. So the only th- pronunciation I could find online was a guy reviewing wine and he called it Santa Lucia. Hmm. So apparently if you're a local, that's what you say. I'm mesmerized by the beauty. Is that gorgeous? Yeah, we have a video in the background. So a lot of this area is taken up by um, Big Sur. This mountain range where these things are seen is the Santa Lucia Mountains, primarily in this area. They seem to be inextricably tied with this area, these dark phantoms looming watching over the area. Are they're humanoid-ish? Yeah, they're humanoid. Yeah, in the sense that they... Well, phantoms just mean they disappear? Yeah, they're phantasmic. They, they're mysterious. Ethereal. Yeah, they disappear. They come and go. That kind of thing. Are like, they... You're going to describe them probably pretty soon. I would imagine. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> I described them a little bit in the intro, but essentially, most people report them being fairly tall, seven to ten feet, shrouded in and black. I, right? I remember yesterday saying, how do they know that? Yeah, because based on like, yeah, what's around... They're like, well, they were... By trees? I just think people like to exaggerate sometimes. I mean, it makes the story more colorful. Mm-hmm. Well, it's consistent. It's a consistent description. Okay, okay. Although I will say... I, I'll suspend my disbelief for a little bit. I will say I did find an anecdote from the mother of John Steinbeck. Oh. You know John Steinbeck? American writer of letters. What? A writer of letters. He yeah. wrote uh, um, Of Mice and Men and um, what's the other one he's well known for? Grips of Wrath. Yeah. Classic American author. So he was from this area and his mom, we'll get to just a little anecdote from her, but she referenced these creatures as being three foot black shadows in the caverns of the cliffs. Well, that's the opposite. I was going to say, well, what's going on here? Maybe she was seeing the young ones that live out by the cliffs. (laughs) The baby phantoms? Yeah, the baby phantoms. Maybe they're shapeshifters. Maybe she was seeing something different. But anyways, there's something dark out there, something looming, something watching. I want to say 
it's pretty interesting. For as old as these sightings go back, as long as far as they go back, mm-hmm. I'm surprised that I had not heard of this. Yeah, me too. Especially when people like John Steinbeck believed in these things. It's one of those local legends, kind of like um, around here we have the Melonheads, which again is something I've never heard of, but it's an older kind of mythology in the area, but people outside might not know. It's definitely strictly California coast and mostly in the Santa Lucia range, although people have supposedly reported seeing dark stoic figures in Texas and other areas, but we're focusing specifically on this iteration of this kind of thing, which is the Dark Watchers. There's something, I feel like, mysterious in an ambient sort of way that they're on these cliffs. Yeah. You know, there's something romantic about that. Oh, yeah. Like, just watching this video, it's just, it's a very mysterious place to begin with. I want to see the Highlands, kind of. Well, as I said, they are inextricably tied to this location, these Dark Watchers. So I, just to give you a little bit of information, people that aren't from California like us are familiar with the area. The Santa Lucia mountain range stretches 140 miles along the coast of California home to 203 named mountains. The mountain range is never more than 11 miles from the coast, so it's always near the water, which is kind of interesting. Do these things, are they able to exist because of that? If these are things are real in the first yeah. place, you know, is there some connection with the water? So much of the range is located in the region of California known as the Big Sur, as I mentioned. And within the Big Sur, that's where the Santa Lucia Mountains rise up from the ocean, creating ridges that are four to 5,000 feet high above the water. So there's some pretty amazing shooting cliffs. Does this go up around the area where we went to DJ's bachelor party? That's what I was going to check. I don't know. It it looks a lot like that. Yeah, and it was such a gorgeous, mysterious, spooky, beautiful area. The fogs and mists among the hills. I think it might be the same area because it looks a lot like it. You know, terrifying experience I had when we were there, driving with DJ along the coast. Oh my gosh, this is scary. (laughs) I love that man. But he is a very confident driver. He's very like... He was probably fine. He has no patience for other drivers. And so I'm just like looking down to the abyss and we're going really fast. <laughs> I was in the back with his dog, his awesome dog, who's just like I'm slobbering sure he, I'm sure me. he's listening. Yeah. Hi, DJ. That was such a good time. Anyway, so these things are spotted by passersby, right? People driving along the coast, hiking trails. But what's interesting about this is that they've been spotted there for a long time. They've been seen in the area, specifically in this area, by locals. Local yokels. Local yokels. People from the nearby cities of Monterey and San Luis Obispo, I think is how you say it, or slow, as the locals call it. That kind of adds some credibility to me, the fact that it's not, because you could say, you know, if you're passing by, uh, you might see some sort of optical illusion. You're not right. used to this kind of terrain, this climate, the fog. There's something going on where you happen to catch something out the corner of your eye in these misty, spooky mountains with shadows dancing and playing tricks on you. Yeah, you might see something, people might commonly see it if they're new to the area. But people that have lived there for a long time experience this, and a lot of them swear by it, including notable people that we're going to get to in a little bit. Yeah, I, I like that locals, because you always get, I'm sure, tourists in certain places where you have a history of hauntings or, you know, a famous UFO sighting or something, where the locals are annoyed by people who talk about this sort of thing. If you have locals are actually witnessing it in their own hometown, in their own region. Well, and specifically, when you say locals, too, it's kind of interesting because obviously there are people from the area, but what's interesting is, is that this area is unique in a sense, especially in California, because it is pristine. It's untouched. You can hike along there, along the trails, but there's so much of it that's undeveloped, preserved. There's a large wilderness area. Most of this range in the Santa Lucia Mountains is just virgin earth, in a sense. Redwoods to rolling hills. I mean, you guys you guys can see in the video there, which we'll post this video in the show notes, guys. It's just a cool, someone did like a, a road trip video along the coastal highway there. I think it's Highway 101, but man, it is gorgeous and full of spooky mystery and majestic beauty. But let's let's just get into it a little bit. Let's get into some of the accounts. Let's do it. Some of the things that people have seen. Now that we kind of established what these things look like, the consistency over time when it comes to uh, specifically the odd, unique description of the cloak, the dark figure, featureless, motionless in particular. And that's kind of one of the key factors, especially as we address one of the skeptical critiques of this skeptical challenges, which is the Brock and Spectre, which we'll get to. But the motionless is, is an important piece too. All right, this comes to us from... Jay Bowser. Yeah. And a lot of these, uh, since they're just anecdotal kind of accounts um, from real quote unquote people, uh, a lot of these come from Reddit. So when you say real quote unquote people, are you saying that the people part of it is quotation or the real is? Yeah. It comes from people on the internet. I guess that's what I mean by real people. Like, But I, I've heard people actually reporting this with their own voices. But I see you have Fortiana here. That's a great blog for like legitimate. Yeah. Fortiana.org, I think it is to form. Uh, for this kind of... It ain't no creepypasta And the, most, most of them spend their time trying to dismiss stuff. Right. We'll get to that in a little bit here because... It's a very skeptical group. Yeah, but some of it comes from Reddit. Some of it comes from uh, Weird California readers submitting their own stories. But then we have stuff from, you know, John Steinbeck and his mom and stuff later on that kind of adds some additional credence to this thing. Oh, and also there's a there's also the idea of the uh, Los Oscuros... What is it called? Consquesque. Los Vigilantes Oscuros. 
or the Dark Watchers. There is a reference to them in the 1700s when the Spanish came to this area. Right. They began seeing these apparitions of the Vigilantes Oscuros, the Dark Watchers. And then soon after, Anglo-American settlers began staking claims in the region, and they too felt the sensation of being watched in the hills. So there's Creepy. additional historical accounts, although it was hard to find the Vigilantes Oscuros documentation, any records online. That that came from the editor of SF Gate magazine. So, hey, she's an editor. She's probably getting sources from somewhere, but I didn't could not find those specific ones. Anyways, that's just kind of an interesting uh, little aside. Well, let's hear some stories. Yeah. Okay, so the first one here comes from Jay Bowser. Way back, mid to late 80s, I used to camp and spend a lot of time in Big Sur. I've seen some strange things in the woods. These things I saw looked like they were wrapped in something black and what looked like small pointed ears on their heads. All they did was stand in one spot. After a while, they would just disappear. I couldn't get enough of whatever they were. Weird. Yeah. So attracted to them? The key element in that is they were, all, like he said, they were like wrapped in something mm-hmm. black. That sounds like it could be a cloak yeah. type thing. They're, what do you say? They were, would stand in one spot after a while they would just disappear. He didn't use the word, term dark watcher. Um, yeah, there's also no hat here. There's little pointed ears. Mm-hmm. I don't, I'm not exactly sure what he was trying to say because there does seem to be an issue with the way he said that. Pointed ears, heads. Yes, so. I think he was drunk. Maybe heads made of ears. Let's do the next one. I think this might be more Yeah, promising. no, I just thought that was interesting because it was weird and kind of didn't really match perfectly. But if he's not aware of the Dark Watchers, he saw something similar. Yeah. Okay, so John, you read the next one? Sure. This is a more traditional account. This comes from uh, Fortiana, that forum, and they, they were discussing the Dark Watchers. And this person responded after it was a very critical kind of explanation of what this, these things probably are scientifically, Brock and Spectre, et cetera. And this guy was like, well, here's what happened to me. And this comes from Aether Blue. About 20 years ago, I worked in Ventura County, as it is locally known, and decided to go for an afternoon hike in the Topatopa Mountains, north of Ojai. I do not recall the name of the trail. What I do recall is that it consisted almost entirely of switchbacks up a steep slope. As is typical of Southern California, the soil was mainly coarse sand and rubble. While the vegetation was California chaparral, but even drier than usual on this south-facing slope, After about a half an hour of progress, I noticed a humanoid figure silhouetted against the sky on the ridge above me. Although I experienced the profound sensation of being watched, I reasoned that this must be someone who had hiked up the trail before me and was enjoying the view. I had no way of accurately estimating the height of the figure and no real reason to try. The distance obscured any details. All I could be sure of was that the figure was definitely humanoid in shape. As I continued up the slope, the figure did not move much, which struck me as odd. People often do admire views for a while, but standing in one place and looking in the same direction for an hour or so is unusual. I considered the possibility that the figure was nothing more than a tree, but if so, then it was the only tree on that part of the ridge, an oddly humanoid in shape to boot. I was pondering this oddity when something whistled past my ear, stopping me in my tracks. Was someone shooting arrows at me? I looked around quickly, but seemed to be alone on the trail, except maybe for the figure at the top of the ridge. It was in its previous pose, though I can't say what it did when I looked away. I considered taking cover, but my options in this direction consisted of lying down in the dust of the trail or taking my chances in dry, spiky vegetation on a steep, loose, and crumbly slope. The meager cover that the nearby bushes offered did not seem worth the chance of a close encounter with a rattlesnake or a certain encounter with ticks. It was then that the hummingbird sounded its battle cry above me, a sort of tapping or clicking sound that I knew well. I looked straight up in time to see the little bird make another attack run. Likely this was a mother protecting her nest. My sense of relief faded quickly as I hastened around the next bend of the trail. There on the ridge was the same humanoid figure, in the same position. The sense of being watched waxed to uncomfortable levels. What would I do if I reached the ridge top and this person was still staring at me? I concluded that there was no reason a dangerous person couldn't go hiking in the wilderness, and headed back down, taking care to speed past the overprotective hummingbird. Now my assumption all along has been that the figure on the ridge was another human being, albeit a decidedly disturbing one, but who knows. Weird. Yeah, when you're out alone in the in the wilderness like that. Kind of a lackluster ending. I thought there'd be a little bit more to it. Yeah. I mean, he didn't even know if it was a watcher. 
Could have been a tree. Yeah, it sounds like his fear overtook him. And a hummingbird was at the arrow. Yeah, that seemed a little... I'm a little d- disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> you wanted it to be a dark watcher shooting arrows? Yes. What if it was sent by the dark watcher? That seems though? a little bit of a reach, Jerry. I mean, maybe it was a robot by the government. Maybe it was a ninja bumblebee. Give that story an F. Yeah, it was too long for, I think, the, the ba- basic idea of it is it, he saw something that resembled the dark Fun watcher. Fun to read, but it's an F. <laughs> All right, well, we have more. No, I think... It was a D. Have you ever felt uh, nervous in the woods when someone else was out yeah. on the trail with you? And you weren't sure what their intentions were? All sorts of watchers and people staring at me. I mean, some of the same attributes, the sense of being watched. We well, are out alone in the wilderness mm-hmm. like that. Yeah, remember the, the episode about the disembodied voices? Mm-hmm. That happened to Sylvan me. Sylvan Dread. Yeah. What happened to you? A disembodied voice. Where did that happen? I was hiking on the St. Lucia. Okay. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> you step in a hummingbird nest? No, that is, I mean, it reminds me of kind of that feeling, you know, like from that story, the disembodied voices. It's like that feeling of being watched, mm-hmm. except that story was cool. <laughs> I'm sorry for the story. We got more, I liked we got it. more good stories. I liked it. It was a story that didn't have any like resolution. Yeah. Right. But I think that so made it so so genuine. Like, we, yeah, we don't know what he saw, but we know that he's not lying about what he it thought. It's true. It's real life. But we didn't even find out if it was a person or not. Right. Sometimes it you just don't know, John. So basically in that story, we have a tree and a, and a <laughs> hummingbird. And the sense of being watched. I, I uh, liked it though. I didn't put this in I any really particular order it. as far as stories from best to worst or okay. worst to best. Well, I, we got mo- way better ones, so yeah. don't turn off. Most of these stories are short. They're anecdotal and they're, I mean, they're brief because the experience is usually brief and there's not much that it does. It's not an action type entity. Is there any right? action packed scenes? No. Because unless someone's like watching then tripped down a hill and then rolled and had to run away from a bear, like the thing doesn't move. Like that's the whole point. It's the right, watchers, right, right? right? And that's the creepy thing about them. Do we ever get like a confirmation that they're more than a tree? Yeah. Okay, good. As far as them vanishing or disappearing, like trees can't do that. And I do think, sometimes you think something's a tree, I mean, when something's far away and it's if it's all black and featureless, and it, or say it looks humanoid like in this case, you, your mind can't really make out what it is. So obviously you're going to think, well, it could be a tree in shadow. So I can't see its features, but it's just kind of humanoid shape, whatever. But yeah, I mean, that's a good point. He could have, I don't know, gone back the next day and been like, was that tree there? Was it a person? I mean, I'm riveted. Not the best story. John, why don't you read that little one that you started reading? Because this, I couldn't find, I have the notes who this is. I, I forget her name. I'll put it in the actual notes, but I accidentally deleted it in our document here for our research. But I'll have it in the notes on the this show. This one notes. that's like a paragraph long. Really short. I just like the description because it's kind of creepy. This comes from a uh, scene gardener of June Lake, California. He reported this in 2011. Up here in the eastern Sierras, we see the dark watchers all the time. They are always out at dusk and dawn. All you see is just a tall, dark silhouette. They almost look like horses standing on their hind legs with the assistance of a walking stick. It's pretty creepy, and nobody has ever seen them up close. They disappear the moment you try to get closer. And that's what would have happened with our hummingbird man. He would have gone poof. But yeah, this, the staff, that's also a common feature. The horse thing's odd. And horrifying. Well, that's another feature too. I mean, that's the way that this person that she's seeing it or has seen it. Another way that could be described is hunched, humanoid, but misshapen slightly. Like the hunchback is a theme that comes up a lot too with the staff and the wide brim. You know, it's, it's actually kind of interesting because I did bring one thing if we get to it later. And it, John, you'll like this. It involves uh, a similar thing, an entity that exists on the cliff sides and it lures people up. But what does the seductive woman in black have? One of her legs, not the sexy leg, but the other leg is a horse leg. What? With a cloven hoof. Well, maybe not a horse then, but it is like a goat leg. So, <laughs> yeah. well, that's great. We'll get to that, but uh, it's... No, maybe it's, it's not a horse leg, but, know, it, but it's a goat leg. <laughs> <laughs> but that might tell you, you right turn that around your face was like, you just realized? <laughs> <laughs> They're not, well, horse loaves aren't woven. That would woven. be weirder for the horse leg because of the shape. Horse loaves aren't woven. Horse loaves? <laughs> horse loaves aren't woven. Um, aren't woven? I thought that's horse what Chris loaves said. aren't woven. But we'll get to we'll get to this entity later. Uh, she's in the Caribbean, the cliffs of the Caribbean. But another dark entity with uh, maybe a cloven, uh, hairy leg. Cool. All right. Well, let's keep going then with these little anecdotes here, and then we can, we get through these. We'll get into some. Uh, oh, I did find some astounding, never before documented evidence. I think solid evidence, or at least interestingly coincidental, when it comes to the ancient connection of the Chumash people. Oh yeah, that's right. I remember that I found, and I could, didn't find this anywhere online. I did some deep digging. I actually explored a virtual tour online in a cave to find this piece of evidence. Cool. So I think this is really interesting. So stick around for that guys. But uh, next story, this comes from Elizabeth 
Benitez of San Mateo, California. Uh, she reported this in 2013. She claimed to have seen these specters in broad daylight. Now, that's interesting because some of the skeptical arguments is that it's is explained by a phenomenon called the Brocken specter, which right. happens at dusk or dawn. Which is German, right, for broken? No. Oh, it sounds German. It comes from a mountain range in Germany. Oh, that's why. Okay. Where this phenomenon happens a lot. But we'll explain that phenomenon a little bit. But the fact that she sees this midday is interesting because that would kind of negate that likelihood of that being an explanation. This is what she said of her encounter. This happened near San Luis Obispo Reservoir. I remember one day my friend and I were coming back from Los Angeles. We passed the San Luis Obispo Reservoir, and as we drove on the road, I saw something at a distance down at the end of the mountain. It was a really big human figure, but it wasn't. It had a black cape, kind of like the Grim Reaper, and it was leaning over, holding onto a staff at a puddle of water, or so that is what it seemed at a distance. It was in daytime, too, so I could identify it wasn't a person. Even in midlight, he was very black and reminded me of a raven. I told my friend that was driving to look over at the mountains, and surprisingly, she was able to see a glimpse of it. I asked her what she saw without giving her my details, and she said exactly what I saw. She only looked at it for about five seconds, but she was able to see it. She almost lost control of the car, too, when she looked away at it. And I begged her to go back and see it, but she was very tired of driving already. <laughs> <laughs> the Dark Watchers are real. A lame friend. Yeah. Take me back to the Raven Man. I feel like that's happened before. It's funny, it reminds me of the Nyx. Have you heard of this? It's a, from Faelor. Oh, yeah. It's like an old man in black on cliff sides. And the only reason it reminds me of this is because you said he was standing over a puddle of water. Yeah. Well, the Nyx is known to wring his beard and hair out on the ground at the cliff. Well, that's weird. So it just reminds me of kind of what you're saying. Like maybe he had already wrung his hair and beard out and that's why he's standing over a puddle of water it's a stretch but uh it just came across as it is so that's kind of an interesting Could be connection. The same guy maybe you have a goat leg he sure didn't good because he's on either okay this next one comes from kick boy face <laughs> he's a credible source what's well, the username he's from the moreno valley california uh, and reported this in 2011 john you want to read this one Yes. I want a ghost kiss i, I want, want a ghost, ghost kiss. kiss that's always in my head we need <laughs> that shirt I want a ghost kiss. I don't know if that one would sell. You do an episode on that, Spectrophilia. Okay, ready? As we were killing time in the pitch black now, we were hanging out inside and outside of the car, killing time, sharing smokes, and we started to distinctly see what looked like black shadows, evenly distributed, completely encircling us. They did not move. They stayed motionless but were of significant size and based on the distance, I would say at least the size of a small car like the bug we ourselves were in. Whatever these were seemed hunched over, perhaps kneeling. Time passed, they never moved, and though we walked around the car and got in and out of the car to see if what we were seeing was some sort of optical illusion, we couldn't explain or discredit what we were seeing. To this day, it racks my brain. So there we go Weird. again. So, I mean, it would be creepy to see. Yeah, mm -hmm. that would definitely. I mean, I mean shadows have, appearing all around you. The size of small vehicles, and they yeah. look like they're kneeling in the gloomy tree line. I think it was it. <laughs> yes, there it, it is. <laughs> we need an it sound for every time you bring them up. So the interesting thing about that is the reason that he was uh, opening and closing the doors, like they were saying, make sure it's not an optical illusion, is because the one optical illusion that gets used as an excuse or explanation for this kind of thing happening is the Brocken phenomena, which I'll explain later. But essentially, it's you're casting a shadow on, on mist. It's your own shadow that you're seeing. Right. These figures. So when he was in the bug, these things looked hunched over. You could think, oh, is this just a, uh, a um, shadow of our VW bug replicating around us in a circle, but then getting out and moving around, not, not able to change the shadows. If that's what it was, it wouldn't make sense. Right. Um, Plus, I thought he said they were humanoid. Yeah, it kind of sounded like that's what he was saying. Just hunched over. Strange. Strange. Either way you cut it. Yeah. Um, What's going on? <laughs> what is that? Cheers. Is this the last day of school? Oh, is there a parade? It's not Memorial Day. At least we're not recording or anything. <laughs> <laughs> is there a parade There's a going parade on? going on outside. Come on, Doylestown. Knock it off. Quit having fun. What a weird road to have a parade on. It's the main road in town. School. It might be the last day of school. So it might It's just be, Sunday. It might be senior drive down oh, yeah, the road day. Are they all kids or? It's, uh, <laughs> there goes Caleb. You guys get to experience a Nadia. parade with us. Last year I sat out and watched them go by and waved. Accordingly. Congratulations, seniors. Good job, seniors. We're happy for you. So this next account, this comes from Brian from Hollister, California, not the store. And he recorded this in uh, 2013. He claimed to have seen these things while he was driving home. Often the way people end up seeing these. 
on the coastal highway there. He says, We were coming home to the San Juan Batista Hollister side when we saw a very large dark figure standing at the edge of the mountains, which is extremely weird since I've never seen anyone cross over the barbed wire fence and I travel that road daily and at all hours. We drove by it slowly, behind the figure, noticing it staring off into the distant valleys and mountains, Fremont's Peak. It appeared to have a large cape with straight shoulders that were very broad. It seemed to have a hunch on its back. At first, from a distance, I thought it was a condor, but when I got closer, it stood almost over 10 feet tall. It didn't notice us driving behind it, but when we found a spot on the cliffy road to turn around and get a better look, it was gone. That's a better account. That's probably the most solid account as far as like descriptors of what people experience. The fact that it was over in this area that seems like it's restricted with barbed wire, just standing, staring off into the distance, These 10 things, foot cloaked. They sound like some other dimensional sentinels or something. Right. Like it seems very like these guardians, you know, they're like phasing in and out of, but they're just staring off into the void. Yeah. I mean, people refer to them as the dark watchers as like a cryptid kind of thing, but they almost seem more like a protective spirit. Yeah. You know, of, yeah, I would not go cryptid route. No. And there's a cool picture I'll put in the show notes, but it's basically someone painted uh, a picture of these things. There's like the mountain range and they're like kind of positioned in equal distances along the range. That's cool. Uh, like they're watching over the area, like they're protecting it. it. sounds almost Tolkien-esque. It does. It sounds like a fantasy type yeah. creature, right? Or something out of some ancient mythology. Some spirit guardian. And that could tie back into the Chumash, which we'll get to in a little bit. Okay, so this next story, or ne this next little account is just interesting. You'll see why, but it uh, also echoes that idea of them being positioned in a certain way, maybe to watch over. If you want to read that, John, this is called The Bird's Eye View. It comes from Les Brennan of... Ramona, California, and this was reported in 2011. While flying my twin-engine beach craft on a southerly course and just 20 nautical miles north of Vandenberg AFB, I glanced toward the Santa Lucia Range just after sunset and saw what appeared to be seven large dark figures spaced evenly apart. They had an even spacing of about one quarter of a mile. Oh, that's cool. That is weird. So, so like, these things are just spaced out every... Maybe they were just surveying. That's kind of what it sounds like they do. I mean, I would guess that this person has flown this route before, so you would know if they were like some sort of structural mm -hmm. thing. That's a guess, but... Quarter mile. There is a, a phenomenon that happens called a glory, and that's when you look down, you can see sometimes the shadow of the plane in like a circular rainbow around it, and that's, that's an optical illusion or an effect, and that's very similar to the Brock Inspector, where people see a, a shadow of their cell right. on the cloud or the mist, this fog. That doesn't explain doesn't this, explain though. doesn't explain a humanoid standing on the mountain, you know, mile intervals. It sounds like a group of people doing a ceremony. That's what the visual mm -hmm. of it for yeah, me is. Definitely. To me, it's, it does sound like what you said earlier, like something from another world yeah. or, or dimension that coming up through the land to just watch over. Right. Yeah. And they're perfectly placed so that they, this is yeah, my region, that's your region. sort of energy manipulation or... You can just see by the place, there's an energy there. Yeah. Certain places like grid lines and yeah. stuff have just an energy. Absolutely. Just looking at those pictures, it seems like that would be one of those places. Yeah. it's. I mean, when we were out there, I'm pretty sure that's where we were. It was just magical and it felt like this primal, like Goonies? majestic power there. Like Goonies? Goonies. Yeah. Goonies would be up along the coast, but Oregon. Further north. Kind of a similar vibe. Yeah, for sure. And obviously that's all speculative, but it is a really hauntingly... That there are these things that, that maybe they see us all the time and mm -hmm. somehow are involved in our day to day, but we can't see them except in these rare moments, you know. Yeah. I really want to go there. It just looks so fun to drive. There's a book called Big Sur by Jack Kerouac. And I was just glancing through it, wondering if he referenced any folklore <laughs> of the area right. or whatever. But his description of the area just sounded so incredible and mysterious in a way. Like the word ghost and stuff was used a lot just because it was ghostly being there, being out there in the ways at night. It's funny he even referenced what we talk about, that feeling when you're on the beach at night. Oh, yeah. You might get a tidal wave coming at you and that kind of you just can't see primal it. fear that's just in you from being in the darkness against the ocean. That vastness. It's like oblivion. Exactly. Great movie. Tom Cruise. Uh, let's do one last anecdote and then we'll take a break. Chris, you want to do this? this is, I do. This comes from... Uh, get it, Chris. Joey in Silmar, California. He reported this in 2016. He's a long distance runner. He'd been out training for a race in the mountains and then he saw something very unusual. Peculiar. More peculiar, if you will. Time of day it was 2 p.m. I was running and up in an area where no human could climb without gear. I saw a black figure in plain daylight. I never seen anything like it up in the mountain. It was darker than dark. I could not explain it. A years passed and today, again, January 24th, 
I saw it again, and in the same spot. Creepy. So if these are these sentinels, maybe they have it makes sense schedules. They have, they have regular posts. <laughs> That's know? interesting. That's kind of cool. I like that he said darker than dark. What is the typical like shadow person? Darker than night. Exactly. You see the makeup yeah, of these things. Yeah, that's an important attribute for sure. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick break. And when we get back, we're going to get into some older references, some older stories, the original recordings of these dark figures, their connection to the Chumash people, if there is one. And I think I found something that's going to be really interesting for you guys. So stick around for that. And we will see you after the break. Bye. I'm Richard Serrett. Join me on Strange Planet for in-depth conversations with the world's top paranormal investigators, alien abductees, Bigfoot trackers, monster hunters, time travelers, alternative archaeologists, remote viewers, and more. As I was on the way to Area 51, I was stopping on the side of the road and just taking measurements, and I found this one spot where time slowed down by a fraction of a second. It's not supposed to do that. From the two big categories, animal mutilations and human abductions, you have to conclude that genetic material is being harvested. Well, I reached for a rifle and uh, I, I turned and looked and it was, it was already moving away and it was descending the bluff. Uh, there's no way any human could have went down it. It was probably a 75 degree angle straight down almost. On Richard Serrett's Strange Planet, we're redefining reality. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Do not go any further. Turn around. Go home. Hi. Hi. That was a fun break. A great break. Maybe the best break. Okay, so to dive back into it, let's get into the origins, the earliest re recordings of these dark watchers. Yeah, where does this begin? Our earliest records that we really have that I could find anyway are literary records. The writings of authors such as Robinson Jeffers, who wrote a poem in 1937, he was from the Big Sur area, or at least the, the California coast. He had a poem called Such Counsels You Gave to Me. You want to read that, Chris? Sure. And this is the first kind of record of it, of this kind of local folklore being written down. He thought it might be one of the watchers who are often seen in this length of coast range. Forms that look human to human eyes, but certainly are not human. They come from behind ridges to watch. He was not surprised when the figure turning toward him in the quiet twilight showed his own face. Then it melted and merged into the shadows beyond it. That's an author including that local folklore that may have previously just been oral tradition in whatever poem he was writing, whether it was based on anything factual or not. I don't know, I just found that interesting. Interesting, what's with the uh, showing his own face? Does that tie into the Brock Inspector? It could. That, you mean that explanation? Mm -hmm. Potentially. Or it could just be an interpretation. But everything else there seems to match as far as like uh, then the vanishing into the fog. This next one, this is the most, I think, well-known from 1938, John Steinbeck's Flight, which is a short story in a collection called The Long Valley. Legendary author John Steinbeck described them in his short story, Flight. The story details a teenage boy who has killed a man and is forced to run into the Santa Lucia Mountains to hide. As he leaves, his mother tells him to avoid the dark watchers with this comment, quote, when thou comest to the high mountains, if thou seest any of the dark watching men, go not near them, nor try to speak to them. The short story later goes on to have the actual dark watchers appear. Quote, Pepe looked suspiciously back every minute or so, and his eyes saw tops of the ridges ahead. Once, on a white barren spur, he saw a black figure for a moment, but he looked quickly away, for it was one of the dark watchers. No one knew who the watchers were nor where they lived, but it was better to ignore them and never to show interest in them. They did not bother one who stayed on the trail and minded his own business. So that's interesting. So that comes from John Steinbeck, yeah, right? Yeah, obviously a, a fiction writer. Right. But he believed in this. He believed in this phenomenon. Yeah, as we'll hear in a moment from his son, who is also an author, I believe. I thought he was a painter. No, his friend is a painter, oh, and they worked okay. together on a book called In Search of the Dark Watchers, which is kind of a collection of these amazing Impressionist paintings of the area, Santa Lucia Mountain Range, but also information, folklore, research of these dark watchers. I haven't been able to get the book because I couldn't get it online, but we'll put it in the show notes. But 
yeah, as we'll see in a moment, John Steinbeck's son talks about his father's beliefs, and we'll hear him talk about that. And his own mother saw these things? John Steinbeck's mother. That's crazy. Yeah, so this is a brief bit about her. Her name was Olive B. Hamilton, or Olive Hamilton Steinbeck. She was born in 1862. Her parents were from Ireland, and her dad was a blacksmith in Castroville, reported to be like a sensible and pragmatic woman. In the 1880s, she taught a grade school down the coast in Big Sur. Her grandson, John Steinbeck's son, Thomas Steinbeck, was born in 1944 and was also a writer like his dad. He said of Olive, his grandmother, that, quote, if she couldn't see it, read it, hear it, touch it, or taste it, it didn't exist. So a very skeptical woman. Right. She wasn't open to fanciful things. So it makes it all the more interesting that Olive Hamilton, a no-nonsense Western woman, no nonsense. freely admitting seeing little dark people who stood about three feet high standing in the shadows of the canyon walls as she traveled on horseback through the dark redwood forest on her way to the schoolhouse. <laughs> No, yeah, weird. So, as I said, these seem to be specifically on the canyon walls. Maybe they're a different type of thing. Maybe they're related to the, you know, or maybe they're the same One of the multitudes of gnome entities that we've covered in the past. Maybe the more recent descriptions of them being 10 feet tall are a confusion of what is actually there. Maybe some people are seeing the Brock Inspector. But the reason the Brock Inspector doesn't make sense is, is well, I'll tell you in a moment when we get there. As far as all of Steinbeck is concerned, and Thomas Steinbeck, the grandson of her and the son of John Steinbeck, the author, uh, this is what he had to say about the Dark Watchers and his father's belief in them. One of the traditions of the Dark Watchers is, that I've always heard, is that if you look directly at them, they know that you see them and they'll disappear like fog. So the trick is if you know they're there, I've heard this from my father, he's, if you think you see them, want to look out of the corner of your eye. Pretend you're looking over here, but look out of the corner of your eye and look at them. I have a friend who claims you saw the Dark Watchers. I'm not, I'm not surprised. I mean, a lot of people have. Because in the old days, even during my grandmother's day, I mean, there were only horse trails. The only wagon roads actually came over from King City. They didn't come from the coast, right? You had to take, these were all trails. And it was always people, you know, they moved things on, on mule backs, so they have a chain of mules with a bunch of cargo on them. And because she wanted to move the mules when it wasn't really in the hot of heat of the day, she went in the morning or the evening. And that's when the dark watches were seen. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting to hear from his uh, Steinbeck son mm -hmm. and the family history there with their own experiences. Yeah. And that other other voice you heard was the artist, the impressionist artist who oh, worked okay. on that book with him. But that'll all be in the show notes. But yeah, it is interesting to hear. What a time to be alive. Taking like wagon trails and out Along in the, the forest coast. by yourself. No cellular service. Cellular service. So before we get into the skeptical argument about the Brock Inspector and my attempt to tear that apart, I wanted to mention the connection of the Chumash people. Now, you read online... Isn't it the Brock Inspector? I thought it was. It's the Brocken. It's named after the Brocken Mountain Peak in a mountain range in Germany. I called it the wrong thing yesterday on the show, so I'll have to... I like Brocken Inspector better. Yeah, I do too. Do we know that that's not the translation? It sounds like I miss saying it every time I say Brock Inspector. Could <laughs> Brocken be German for broken? Maybe, but it's spelled B-R-O-C-K-E-N. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, continue. How do you spell broken? Okay, no C. Okay. Um, it is a different language. Back to school for you. <laughs> <laughs> the Chamish connection. Okay, so anytime you look at this stuff online, and by the way, this is one of those folklore legends that is regurgitated everywhere. Uh, you'll go to like Listverse or Live Science and the description will be copy pasted from sfgate.com. There's a lot of just repeated information about this and not a lot of deep research looking into it. So some of the places I found were saying things like, yeah, the Chumash people, the native people of the area that lived there for, you know, 10,000 plus years, uh, originally peopling the Americas, et cetera, et cetera. They would carry on the story of the Dark Watchers telling their young ones about these figures in the mountains to scare them and keep them safe, blah, blah, blah. I don't think that that's true, or at least I've found no evidence of that. I read from a book that is like the one kind of... Uh, reference? Reference one real academic work about the Chumash people, and it doesn't say really anything like the Dark Watchers. The closest thing is they do have a myth or belief about kind of supernatural creatures. They live in what's called the first world, which is below our middle world, middle earth for you uh, Tolkien fans. And it's inhabited by monsters which enter the human world after dark, but they're not described as having the same characteristics as Dark Watchers. Right. So that's kind of a stretch. So people are like, oh, what they probably did was when Steinbeck talked about the Dark Watchers, allegedly hearing it from his mom, it became a ghost story in the area and they, they probably just tied it to the local tribe that had lived there, the Chumash people, because it gives it some credibility. Right. Right. Oh, well, the Indians talked about it. So, you know, but I found something. Yeah, this is cool. I found something really interesting. Okay, so in that book called December's Child, a book of Chumash oral narratives, the closest thing I found, which is kind of interesting, is the most important causative agencies in the universe are powerful beings that are more frequently indifferent to man than supportive. After dark, one might meet any variety of hostile entities or even a spirit or ghost. One might also be accosted by some kind of 
where being. And after death, the journey to the land of the dead is full of dangers to be surmounted. Now that description of more frequently indifferent, mm-hmm. I mean, that's the closest thing I could find because right. these things don't care about you. They just stand still and yeah. if you try to approach them, they, they watch. But somewhere I saw a reference to cave paintings. Yeah, this is the cool part. And I searched online for uh, Chumash Cave Painting, Dark Watcher, et cetera, et cetera. Couldn't find anything. So I found a virtual tour of a Chumash Cave with paintings. And I went piece by piece along the wall and I found this, John. What do you think this looks like? On the left, I have a picture of a representation of Dark Watcher. And then the thing on the right is the cave painting of the Chumash people. So what do you want me to say? Oh, the painting on the right? Yeah. What does it look like? A top hat man. That's right. A man with a... It's like a... Shadow Hatman character. It looks like a hat man. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that weird? Weird. But the skeptical argument is that there's no connection to the Chumash people in anything like the Dark Watchers. Oh, I gotcha. Okay, yeah. And that's the official, like, you look anywhere. Yeah, I don't know what else that would be. Yeah, isn't that odd? That's pretty fascinating. It's obviously a figure. That's a good find, Jer. It's a figure with this big hat. And, you know, they didn't have big hats like that. Yeah. It's kind of like when the primitive civilizations would draw UFO craft. Exactly. Or planes or or anything, yeah. It reminds me of the shaman. And what's interesting is this painting is thousands of years old. And if there was a belief in something like the Dark Watcher or something, it would be carried down orally. Right. After the decimation of the the Chumash people by, I believe, Mexico, I think the Mexican government rounded up the Chumash people and then gave them to, they gave them as ranchos or like ranch hands to, I think they're soldiers who were given land in Alta, California. I'm not sure. I read this very briefly. I could be all wrong. But the point is their people were decimated. I don't know how many are surviving, if there are any. If any of you guys out there are any, let me know. Um, Very sad. But- what information do we really have about their beliefs other than this one kind of book that I referenced? And if this is a much, much, much older recording of something that they believed in, it definitely looks like a, I mean, it looks like a hat <laughs> yeah. man, right? It looks like what people see in their bedrooms at night. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Even with, even with the hands out like, ah, yeah, I'm scaring you. And obviously this is just an interpretation right. of a cave painting, but it's just interesting that in their cave painting, they do have something that looks like a tall hatted, important Weird looking figure, hatted man. I don't know. I just think that that's even cape like, really, if you look at the. Yeah, it does. Oh, it billows down yeah. the body. So let us know what you guys think about it in the show notes. I feel like I should make a blog about it or something because I haven't seen anyone. Yeah, you definitely No one's should. like fought back against. I think it's Brian Dunning of Skeptoid that said that there was no connection to the Chumash people. And again, there might not be, but this cape painting I think is, is notable. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Skeptical explanations. Yes. The Brock Inspector, right? I don't think this is a very good explanation. I don't either. I mean, it's At an interesting phenomenon, but yeah. it doesn't seem like, because it doesn't have, okay, we'll explain it. Okay. I was just going to say, by the way, broken German is Brocken. Gebrocken. Okay. Cool. There you go. Cool. Thank you. Uh, well, I rest my case. It's spelled, it's spelled uh, Brocken, B-R-O-C-K-E-N. I'm pretty sure. Although autocorrect corrected all of them. Okay. This is B-R-O-C-H-E-N. Okay. That's close. <clears throat> it could be some connection. Anyway. Gebrocken. So you've seen pictures of this Brock Inspector, John? What yes, it like? I, okay. saw, I saw them. Guys, they'll, they'll be in the show notes. You can Google it too, obviously. Uh, but basically, it's a natural phenomenon, right? Yeah. It looks like it's your shadow. It's your shadow on fog or mist or a cloud with a halo of light around it, which is pretty distinct. And all these all these dark watchers seen, I haven't seen read one. Maybe there are some confusions out there. I haven't read one that says rainbow halo. There's a rainbow halo or a halo of light. Also, if you're walking around and you're approaching this thing or you're waving your hands. You're going to see it mirroring you. You can see pictures of the the Brock Inspector phenomenon where where hikers have their hands up and they're moving around and it's mimicking because it's just your reflection. But these dark watchers stand still. That's that's like their key feature. They don't move. Right. So you can approach it. You can run away, run sideways, jump around, and it stays perfectly still. So I don't think that's a great explanation. But nevertheless, this is the one that's mostly given. This comes from Earth Sky. Just so you guys know what it is when you see it. If you were mountain climbing at a time of day when the sun was low and behind you, And if you climbed high enough to look down into a mist below you, you might witness the shadowy figure of the Brock Inspector. It's your own shadow that you see, cast on the surface of the mist below, surrounded by a halo-like ring of light. The sun must be behind you. You're seeing your shadow projected in front of you through the mist. Bottom line, the Brock Inspector is your own shadow cast on mist below you when you are mountain climbing. The shadow may appear enormous and has a luminous rainbow-like ring around it. Again, not something that's not an reference in these accounts. It sounds like it's a different phenomena. And it's in front of them, like lower, isn't it? Yeah. You're looking down on it. That's specifically, like. yeah. And a lot of these, and I think that's right. I feel like I read another description where it was the opposite. You have to have the sun behind you and then your shadow going out. So there's no way it's above you. Right. Because the sun's never below you. So there well, we go. Well, if you're high up, the sun can be lower. If it's on the horizon, like water level, and you're above. Not in the mid-afternoon. Very, Whichever yeah. way it works, the point is Unlikely. that the people experience it in all different ways. Like these things are above them, below them. You know what I mean? Right. Not necessarily with the sun behind them. And no rainbow, no halo effect. 
other things that I thought were important to note about this, because I do think this is the major argument against it. This phenomena has been known since at least as early as 1780, discovered by Johann Silberschlag, uh, a Lutheran theologian and naturalist from Germany. And it comes, like I said, uh, from a, a mountain peak known as Brocken. It's part of the Harz Mountains of Germany. And in that area, of course, it's similar. You have high altitude, low altitude clouds, mist. It sounds like it's a similar kind of like, this is a very misty area. And it's up in the mountains, right? The Santa Lucia Mountains. So you can see why the phenomena could easily occur here. I haven't seen any pictures specifically from this area of the phenomena, but it could happen here. It's the right kind of setting. So at first I was like, this makes sense. This is probably what it is. But it doesn't make sense the more you read. Also, this phenomenon has been known in pop culture since 1828. Samuel Taylor Coleridge's poem, uh, Constancy to an Ideal Object, concludes with an image of the Brock Inspector, and this is kind of cool. And art thou nothing, such thou art, as when the woodman winding westward up the glen, at wintry dawn, when o'er the sheep track's maze, the viewless snow mist weaves a glistening haze, sees full before him, gliding without tread, an image with a glory round its head. There's that glory, the halo, right? Uh, the enamored rustic worships its fair hues, nor knows he makes the shadow he pursues. Yeah. So that's an 828, obviously talking about the Brock Inspector. Knowing, aware of the phenomenon. Aware of the fact that it's your own shadow. I feel like anyone experiencing this is going to be like, yeah, oh, I'm obvious. moving, it's moving, it's my shadow. What's kind of interesting is on the uh, the Fortiana forum we talked about where some of the stories came from, mm -hmm. there was a response from a, a member about this. He said, my wife and I saw the Brock Inspector on Peñero Wen, Snowdonia. That sounds like a wintry place. Uh, many years ago, it was spectacular. But although neither of us had read of the phenomena before, we were never in doubt that it was our own shadow. The bit that doesn't make sense in the case of the Dark Watcher encounters is when the observer moves and the watcher does not. Right, like we were talking about. Yeah, so that just doesn't make sense. And then the staff member, who you see him all the time at Fortiana, his whole point was like trying to like disprove it, right. essentially, because a lot of it he thinks is the Broken Spectre, but he says, the fairly obvious conditions conductive to Brock Inspectors recommend them as the cause of the classic sightings the huge figures atop of the ridges at sunset and dusk. However, other accounts, persistent mystery figures seen at closer range, don't fit this explanation. This is why I'd love to disentangle the classic sightings from the others. I suspect the non-classic cases have been added to the lore in relatively recent times, causing a confusion between the classic historical phenomena and more modern incidents. So he's suggesting that maybe the larger ones that are seen against a cloud are the broken spectrum. Right. They obviously aren't the only ones. Yeah. So yeah, that's it. That's interesting. Stuff. Fascinating. Very fascinating. What do you guys think? What do you think out there? I think it's possible, you know. I like to believe there, there are uh, dark watchers. I mean, you know, if there's, especially if you believe in any sort of multidimensional angle beings that, because that's what it seems like to me. Yeah. If they are real, there's some sort of like. Otherworldly. Watchers. <laughs> yeah. Like they yeah. literally come here and have some sort of job or. Some role we don't understand. Yeah. There's accounting. Maybe it has to do with making sure time stays intact or oh, something. Oh, right, like the men in black angle. <laughs> kind an interesting of. idea. Yeah. yeah. Time stays intact. Like the matrix doesn't glitch out. <laughs> it's funny you say that because I read something today about shadow people specifically and someone, just random person I was reading on a comment on YouTube or something, and they said they believed that uh, shadow people are a glitch in the matrix where you you see a non-active user just observing the gameplay. When you see that shadowy person in, the, in your peripheral for a moment, oh. it's just like an, a, a player that's not playing, but he's just watching. Oh, when it's, I see what you're saying. I, I don't get that. What do you mean? Well, sometimes when you, when you play like a video game, yeah. you know, and you can go in third person mode, and you can watch your avatar moving around. It's a glitch where you see the figure of the actual person outside of the matrix. Or sometimes if you're in a game and then you hit the pause menu or you're doing something else, your character might turn gray uh -huh. or be like a shadow version of you. Right. And so he's making the suggestion that he, yeah, he's, players he's not, relating it to obviously like a uh, simulation theory sort of thing. It doesn't make sense. So, so what, what no, would I, these being, I, I'm just curious. I know it's not real probably, but I'm just still trying to understand what they would be in relation. They would be the, the person playing your character, but not these dark watchers. You're talking about like, no, 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 no. Just shadow, shadow people. people. Yeah. yeah. Playing like you. Yeah. Oh, so wouldn't you, <laughs> wouldn't you not be conscious then when they, Yeah, I don't understand how, well, there, have you heard of the third man theory? That like you are, you're in control basically of like your life and everything, but there is a third man, I think that's what it's called, that accounts for a strange phenomenon. For example, when suddenly they've had people who reported their hands turn a car wheel to avoid an accident when they weren't doing it. Something that's not necessarily playing you, but with you watching you. It's like your, your like upper avatar. Angel or something. Yeah, yeah, that's another description of that. So a yeah. divine intervention, but you're saying from the simulation theory type idea. That's would be, that, yeah, which I don't subscribe to necessarily, but I just thought it was kind of fun. Interesting to think that like if you are a character in a game that you're playing, if you were programmed in a way to think that your choices were yours, 
because of the algorithm's Cellular build that when service. a person goes left on the thumbstick, it triggers something in your mind to make you want to go left. So you're thinking you're making all the choices yourself. In right. reality, like yep. you're just cooperating with your operator. Yeah. Yeah, that's just weird. It's weird to think about. Interesting. I think I have autonomy. I think we should close it out with the uh, goat-legged lady. All right, do it. The seductive woman I mentioned earlier. The seductive dark entity. I could use some of that. This comes to us from the Caribbean, known as the tale of La Diablesse, also known as La Hablesse of the Caribbean. La Diablesse is a nocturnal spirit from the islands of the Lesser Antilles in the Caribbean Sea. During the day, she hides in the big root buttresses of kapok trees. At night, she emerges to roam around, usually on quiet roads, but she may come into populated areas too, as the desire takes her. Mm. She may or may not be a tree spirit, uh, which is cool, because those are all over the world. Africa, yeah. Ireland, yeah. It's just cool. It's such a common thing. Um, La Diablesse resembles a beautiful woman dressed in a long, romantic, flowing dress and a big <laughs> floppy hat. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> How do you describe it? Honey, your, your dress is so romantic tonight. I know, it's a lot. It's a weird description. Uh, but there's, there's the floppy hat. There's the floppy hat oh, connection. That's, that's why I was connecting this. Oh, purple mommy. Oh, oh my gosh. Don't even bring up purple mommy, bro. <laughs> okay. Okay. She's got the floppy hat and the romantic dress, right? Sorry, continue. Her clothes may sound old fashioned with the floppy hat and all, but it's a daring, sexy outfit, John. Sounds like a fashion review from some. Her skirt is slit high on one side to reveal a shapely feminine leg. <laughs> of course, the clue to her identity is what we talked about earlier, guys. It's the other leg, the one hidden by the voluminous fabric of that sexy dress. That's the leg with the cloven foot. Some manifestations of La Diablesse may have an entire donkey's leg, believe it or not. Not as cool as a horse. Does that have anything to do with the watchers? Yeah, we'll no. see. We've got the no. Uh, no. we've got the floppy hat, right? She, well, let me get to the rest. Okay, okay. La Diablesse lures men to secluded areas near the tops of cliffs. They're <laughs> anticipating romantic assignations. I don't know what that word means. Or some easy sex. Instead, she finally removes the big hat, revealing a grinning skull, <laughs> and then kicks her victim off the cliff with her powerful cloven hoof. <laughs> it is unclear whether her attacks are random or whether she targets specific victims for vengeance, justice, or less commendable reasons. She strongly resembles goddesses Aisha Quindisha or Lilith, which we're familiar with, who lure men sexually only to punish them, often fatally. So That's, again, the connections yeah. there, Couple obvious, things I obviously to a say. stretch, but the, the cliff the cliff top thing, right? Uh -huh. uh, the uh, the gown, it didn't say black necessarily, I guess, I don't think, but the big floppy hat. I just think mm -hmm. the big floppy hat is such a weird thing on anything. I think you're really reaching for a connection, I am. but yeah, it's yeah, an interesting no story. It's also the I agree. I don't think there's any connection I really just like the color of it. It's a cliffside thing. Yeah, it's a cliffside cliff side mystery. Yeah, it's a creepy thought, though. Well, then there's also the leg, right? The hairy... It's the skull. I just imagine that last shot with just like taking the yeah, hat she's off. Like, like, she's like smiling and <laughs> screaming and it kicks <laughs> him off. Just punts him off the cliff. Yeah, that's, that is pretty creepy. Like oh. the dude in 400. There seems to be a common theme. John's had a sequel. 400? Pretty sure it's 300. It's 300. 400. John, the avid moviegoer. That's interesting, though, the one hidden leg. leg. That's, yeah. It just reminds me of the horse connection. Well, it's also like the Hildefolk, or the Huldra. Is that what it's called? Huldra, An Icelandic yeah. lore. There's a tale. A lot of these female luring entities will have something that, if you pay attention, it gives away their true identity. Right. And you don't want to get close to them. It's like, they're, it's like giving away your will. Yeah. Will, like it, if you want to look for the truth, you can find it. But if you want to be deceive yourself, you can allow yourself to be lured in and right. conquered by these aggressive. Pay no attention to the woman in the red dress, right? Femme fatales, if you will, of the paranormal world. Anyway, let us know what you guys think about the dark one. I think there, it's a fun, kind of romantically beautiful image of these watchers on the cliffs. I think it's one of the coolest folklores I've heard from a region that's very region specific. Yeah, and, and I do like that it traces back through time a bit. Yeah, and I think you know what I found with the Chumash cave painting. Who knows? But there could be reality to it. It does seem like people are seeing something. And it doesn't sound like the Brock Inspector phenomena is, right. is accurately uh, explaining it. Yeah, I, I agree. Brock Inspector, no go. But there's something out there, guys. What do you guys think? Do you guys think this is just an illusion? Have you, do you live in California? Do you live near the coast? Have you seen this phenomenon? Have you heard of it? What do you I believe? I bet some of our listeners out there, we have a lot of Californians listening. I bet someone out there is familiar. If not, have had their own experience. And hey to our California friends, DJ and Alyssa. Oh, yeah. If you happen to be listening. 
Um, thanks for everybody who tuned in and uh, enjoyed the show. I hope you enjoyed it. Jeremy works hard for you guys. I did. I was very sick. <laughs> Chris and I were both sick. <laughs> yeah, and we very both sick. researched Powered through. our butts off and uh, hopefully presented something that you guys hadn't heard and found interesting. So dig yes. deeper. Dig Always deeper be digging hole. deeper. Dig the weird, you know? Absolutely. Sorry. What? Are we done? We'll see you next time, guys. You guys have a good uh, time until we talk again. <laughs> I yes. like that. Yeah. <laughs> have a good time until we talk again. All right. Bye bye now. Bye bye. Something watching. Oh, I, honey, I shrunk the kids. Yeah. That was the reference. I get it. What? Honey, I shrunk the kids. Really dumb. Yeah. <laughs> but I followed your brain path I'm there. Glad. Because he because he said that sometimes they're ten feet tall, sometimes they're three, and, and he said Rick Moranis. I was like, oh honey, my I shrunk gosh. Kids. I said maybe Rick Moranis got involved. <laughs> I wonder if anybody else out there caught what you're trying I to say. I would love for like if this was video. As soon as John says one thing, it slowly zooms in. We get quiet and it goes into his brain, and then it follows the track <laughs> to the next. Like it's a Rick Moranis movie. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like like detour. <laughs> Over the cliff. I was trying to remember how they actually got shrunk, and then I remembered Rick. He built a ray. I had a ray gun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it all went downhill after that. Good show. Let's talk about the the phantoms, though. Yeah. You want, you want to read one, Chris? I think the first one. Let me go. Let me go. Go first. Okay. And well, then we, my name's there. I don't care. It's about like four sentences, and then the long.